Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Axon Bulletin. It's Tuesday. Um, this is becoming your usual Tuesday trio. It's myself taking the convo, sporting my brand new pinstripe Celtic away kit. Patrick McGilps to my left, right on your screen. And Natasha is down there at the bottom. How are we doing, folks? Excellent. Always good to join you guys on a Tuesday and talk about all things Celtic. Yep, absolutely. Patrick, how are you? Well, uh, closer to the new season, so all the better for that. <clears throat> Just wish we could uh, have a few more transfers by now, but I'm sure we'll get there in the end. Yeah, I'm sure we will get there in the end. We've had an interview from Ange Postecoglou. You know, I like my quotes on these interviews. We'll get onto that. There's been plenty of transfer business. There's been some people going out the door. And there's also somebody that's a free agent with a very famous surname um, to Celtic fans. So we'll get into all that. I'm of a new training gear, and I know we'll probably frustrate people when we have a quick uh, two or three minute chat around the, the new shield badge training gear, but we'll get on to all that stuff. Let's kick off with um, an outgoing uh, transfer, and I'll come to you in this party because for nearly a year now, me and you have been debating as Adam Montgomery, a left back and a left winger. <laughs> um, he's headed to St. Johnson um, under Callum Davidson, there obviously stayed up last season, they absolutely battered in Burness in that playoff game. He said he'd up there. What do you make of the, the loan move? And on that, do you think he's going to be playing left back or left wing there? And by the way, two St. Johnson left backs have got Achilles injuries, so I know where he's going on that team. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm going to say left back. I think he's a left back, but I think it's a good move. Um, I think, you know, guys like Mikey Johnson, it's probably what they needed at that time in their career because, I mean, Mikey was played with injuries, never really get game time, and then look at it now, I think he's like 23 and it's just not really happening for him. Whereas Montgomery, I think, is still 19. Still needs to toughen up. Um, still needs game time. But I think he needs to do that at a level that Celtic play at in the SPFL. So I think it's a great move. Um, you know, maybe not the best team to go to, but he went to Aberdeen. And I know he had injuries, but he never really get the game time. Um, but aye, it's a decent enough move. Hopefully if he plays, whether it's left back or left wing, wherever Ange wants him to play, as long as he gets the game time. Yeah, the, the Tasha, he went up to, to Petordu, but it's actually in a Celtic jersey. He's probably going to be remembered for last season at Petordu. He's assist for Jota, which kind of kicked his own. Um, and that run of form that we got, it ended that dismal away form that we'd had and maybe went on the run. It was a bit unfortunate how it worked out. Aberdeen obviously went up there under Stephen Glass. He then lost his job. Jim Goodwin came in. Obviously not fancied him too much if he's not wanting to, to sign him again. What was your take on this move to St Johnston? Good, yeah. I think Montgomery's one of the players um, from that sort of you know fringe youth sort of setup that I think does have a good career ahead of him. I've seen him, you know, we've all seen him a few times. He's got potential there, and exactly like you guys have said, what we need to do to enhance and develop players like that is get them loan moves. He's not going to get enough first team squad time. The B team probably isn't quite right for him, so a loan move is absolutely ideal. And I think for him, a loan move in the league again is is exactly what we need from and a team like St Johnston, who are likely to be doing a relatively strong amount of defending, is exactly what he needs to, you know, toughen him up, develop him, make him into, you know, a sort of first team player. And yeah, let's have a look at how he gets on there and then have a look at him at the end of the season and see, you know, how he fits into our, our plans going forward. So yeah, exactly the sort of thing I like to see happening to players like him. And um, yeah, we'll keep an eye on his development. Interesting to note, our last fullback that went to St Johnston on loan um, didn't get a glowing review from St Johnston. They weren't overly impressed by him. And look at him now. Of course, Anthony Ralston, now a fan favourite at Celtic. Um, so it just shows you what maybe a loan move at St Johnston can do for a player, regardless of how it works out. So maybe Montgomery can uh, go there on loan and then maybe develop himself into a first-team starter for Celtic. Who knows? Yeah, that would be nice. Um, obviously, as you say, Patrick, he is only 19, so there's plenty of time left. And I think that's right, Natasha. And, that, you know, I don't think the B team would have been the right place for him to go at this point in time. Um, I mean, you've had that taste of first-team football, mm. 18 appearances last season, which is actually quite startling to think about. Obviously, he was using a real big part of Angie's team initially. Um, it's interesting to see it will go. Patrick, that's one left back now out the door. Do you expect that quick turnaround? Obviously, once a big mate, Vasilis Barkas, who's given Celtic glowing reports in, in Greek press. I don't know if you've read these comments. Um, he departed the club to FC Utrecht 
and right away within a couple of days but in came Big Ben Seacrest from Dundee United Jake we'll see that turn around went coming out the door and hopefully Alexandro coming in from Argentina I think so I think so I think you know there's a wee theory online that he's got a two game ban he served one of the games and Celtic won and he served the other one before we officially register him uh, so that he's not banned for any SPFL games so I don't know if that's what Celtic are actually doing but it's a good wee theory and I, I think that signing's inevitable you know, he's yeah, there's all these other theories about who he follows on Instagram and everyone DMing him and stuff, you know, all the usual stuff. But I twenty one he, he he's he's got a bit of you could say passion in him, you know, he's a bit aggressive. Um never had an Argentinian before. Um we've been looking for covering left back. I think it's a it's a great signing. A lot of people rate him quite highly. You know, La, is it Lannis? I think their fans are quite yeah. updated at losing him, so I hopefully we get that one over the line before the uh, the preseason starts. Natasha, would you buy into um, that feeder that we get one left back out? One will probably come in and maybe be Patrick's feeder there that he's done his one game ban. Um, I thought I thought the player actually made a bit yeah made a bit more of it than probably expected. There wasn't too much in it though, so the club, but I think we all kind of held our breath at the club fighting could this uh, disrupt the deal. But it looks like a player and looks as if he can definitely add something to our team if we do get uh, Bernabe in. Yeah, he does. And I think you can tell a lot about a player when the fan base that he's coming from are, are sad to lose him. Um, I think that shows the regard that he's held in there. And yeah, again, I think it'll be one that the work's being done or has been done in the background and we're just more waiting on the official announcement rather than anything else. But it's always the way when a player's name is linked and we're told it's imminent, you know, we expect imminent to be within the next hour and then people start to get impatient. But I'm relatively calm about it. I think it'll get done. I think um, it's just a case of getting all the moving parts into place for the announcement. And yeah, maybe it could be something to do with the, the additional ban that he's got to serve. Um, although if he ends up missing one of the first you know, SPFL matches, I'm not sure that would be the end of the world in terms of, of any deal going through. Um, so yeah, no, excited about that one. I think he'll, he'll be a good signing. I quite like that he's got a bit of fight about him. Um, like you, Declan, I think that the, the red card and the ban was a bit harsh. I don't think he did too much wrong but maybe a, a good lesson for him in terms of you know what he'll be faced with over here in Scotland as well that you are just not going to get away with those sort of things playing here so yeah maybe nice for him to, to learn that lesson and maybe temper him a little bit but I like the passion I like the bit of fight I like the bit of desire um, and by all accounts a very good player as well so he'd be a great one to get in in the door and I think you know he would then become, of course, your, your first choice left back. But Greg Taylor would be, you know, an able deputy, if you like. But it doesn't mean that we also need Adam Montgomery. It doesn't mean that we also need Liam Scales. So it does make sense for them to, to move out on the door onto loan moves while we have, you know, Burnaby in and then Taylor as a, as a deputy. Because, you know, Taylor gets a bit of criticism and he got a bit of criticism last season but for me he's one of the players from last season who really did improve with every game now I'm not saying that he's the best left back in the world or even the league but he was very able at his job when he came in and did it um so for me he's he's a good backup to have um and it's nice again that we talk about having these you know players that can step up to play in that sort of first team spot and then having you know a reserve behind them who can step into that position so good business and look forward to getting that one over the line yeah, I think for Greg Taylor as well, it should improve his game. You, you don't want to be a stick on in any team, um, and a bit of healthy competition won't do him any harm. And we've seen last season the manager that takes players, he gives players a chance. Even another left back coming in, I don't think it's going to put Greg Taylor's nose out of joint. Um, as you say, Natasha, he definitely improved last season. He was a key part of what we did well last season. But you know, I think it's only going to improve his game. Um, Patrick, in terms of what you were saying earlier about that transfer going through. Angie's comments yesterday he said for me the most important thing is to get the right players in that's the key for me and it's not just about them as players it's about them as people again there's a big emphasis on this it's a big big emphasis on getting the right people in rather than just based on talent and for that to happen we can't put timelines on things obviously the earlier we can get players in the better the, the manager seems very at ease Patrick from that interview yesterday I think there is moving parts to this um, you know we, we complained during the, the catastrophe that we had two seasons ago now of things being leaked to the press and whatnot. We don't want that to happen. I'm quite happy for Celtic to keep their business quiet as long as they, uh, the, the eventual transfers end up going through. Do you agree with that? Yep, um, 100%. Uh, 
you know, we've got two signings already. Um, you know, Bernabe and Jota as well. They both sort of seem inevitable. Um, they are, they have been dragging on for a week or two now, but as you say, and Jack, and as Ange says, um, you know, as long as it happens, they can't really put a timeline in these things. I think we've still got 32 or 33 days until the first game of the season. And even then, I'm sure we can dispatch Aberdeen without Jota and Bernab- Bernabe. Is that how you pronounce his name? Bernabe? Just don't or call him Bernabe Alexandre. or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just call him Alexandro. That's easy. Aye, there you go. Um, but, yeah, Ange is right. As long as we get them over the line, as long as he sees them as the right signings, then I'm quite happy to go along with it. And, uh, you know, that I think the positive here is we don't have a Champions League game until maybe, I think it's September the 5th uh, or September the 6th. So I know you've got the, the Glasgow derby the weekend before that, but, you know, we've given ourselves a lot more time by winning the league last season and getting that automatic entry into the Champions League. So it, it shows that if you do your if you do the work and you know, you win the league and you get that advantage. It can help. It gives you a lot more time to prepare yourself. Yeah, there is a lot plenty of time again and subscribes to, to that and saying that we have a unique see that scenario this year and we've got a clear pre season without any competitive game, which is a great advantage for us. So for me, apart from staying for the squad, just being able to work with the group of players we had last year in pre season is going to be invaluable as well. So listen, the chat's all very good just now. Um, something to add into that chat is this and this comes in from Little Maestro big fan of his profile picture with the ball Jimi Hendrix in it who is saying that Jordan Larson uh, would be more than welcome big expectations so be yourself son Natasha I've come to you in this one last night our good mate Fabrizio Romano broke the news that uh, Jordan Larson son of the King of Kings would be departing Sparta at Moscow he's been training himself in his homeland of Sweden um, he is now going to become a free agent is it a no-brainer for you, or should we be going anywhere near this? Just leave the, the, the Larson name untouched? Yeah, I'm in two minds over this one, to be honest. Probably for the same reasons or on the same basis that you have a bit of reluctance every time that Henrik's linked with a return in some sort of coaching capacity. You get that slight hesitation that, do we want to revisit it? Let's leave it untouched. And it almost feels the same when Jordan's linked with us, despite him being his own man and everything. Um I think previously, or you know, more in recent years, the issue would have been the transfer fee. I don't think we would have been able to buy Jordan Larson first from Spartak Moscow. But obviously that hurdle's now been taken out of the equation given that he's a free agent, um, which makes it a little bit more interesting. Um the pressure on Jordan would be enormous, wouldn't it? The comparisons would be constant, the media would play up to it. Um and above all, I'm not sure that would be very good for Jordan, who's his own man who wants to forge his own game, be his own player. Um, so I'm not sure how well that would do for him and his development. But on the other hand, he seems like a confident guy. He could thrive under that. And there's no no secret that he obviously, has mentioned it before, loved his dad's time at Celtic and being part of that. We've all seen the photos of him here. And I'm sure for Jordan, there's something in the back of his mind too that might fancy playing at Celtic Park one day. It just seems like a nice sort of full circle moment but even if you take sentiment out of it you know Jordan's a really good player and he probably fits Angie's system you know rather than just being the sort of out and out striker goal scorer you know he's more of an attacking forward he's been played through the middle he gets played out right he's versatile he can fit a few different roles and that's similar to how we you know see players Ange likes Ange likes players to be sort of flexible like that if you just look at how he plays Kyogo, Maeda, Abada you know, I think Jordan could also fit that system in terms of he could play any of the sort of forward roles and it gives us another attacking option like that. Um, so I think even if his second name wasn't Larson, you'd look at him and think, you know, that guy's a good option who fits our system and obviously a very good player. And what a great deal to be able to get a player like that on a free transfer. Um, but given that, you know, given his status and given his potential, a lot of clubs will be interested. But if he does fancy the move to Celtic at some point in his career... Um, I'm not sure that he's going to get a better chance than this. You know, the, the hurdle's been taken out of our way. So if he does fancy doing it, if he doesn't want to miss the chance, miss the opportunity, now would probably be the time to do it. So, yeah, who knows? I, if I had to put money on it, I don't think I see it happening. But I would say that now is the chance. Mm, no, I, I'm totally agreement with that. I, I'm not too sure it will happen. But as you see, Natasha, the hurdles are there. We probably couldn't have afforded them. 
um, in terms of what would be the transfer fee. And Daniel's again with you in that. If you take his surname away from him, he's a good player. Um, he's got the credentials. Pat, are you in agreement with that? If you did take the, the surname away from this would be a, a player that would fit the system and pro- would probably add quality to our team? Yeah, um, I think it's a signing that we should try and make. But again, I agree with you too. I don't think it will happen. You know, as you say, if you take the surname away, you probably still sign the player. When it comes to pressure, you know, I think he'll obviously have confidence in his own abilities, he'll have confidence in himself. And then, you know, Angie's the type of guy who would take the pressure off him because he, he likes the right characters in the team. It's very much, um, there's a focus in the team and the group as opposed to individual individual players. And I'm sure if he was struggling, Angie would know what to say and do. Um, not that many players have struggled under Angie. You know, a lot of players have gotten better at, uh, last season. Um but no, as you say, the hurdle's been taken away from us. I personally would like to see him at Celtic, but I don't think it will happen. Yeah, and just to, to come in on this, Michael also a good point. He's asking is, is Bobo Baldy possibly get a son? Um, yeah, that'd be quite nice. I do think we're needing that type of central d- defender. Um, to, to kind of tie what we're talking about, Natasha, and um, that hurdle, especially that spend that we'd have to uh, shell out for, for Jordan Larson if he hadn't had the, the contract terminated. Of Spartak Moscow, and there's a comment asking why the contract's been terminated. I think that's all to do with uh, the, the conflict that is ongoing and the, the torment that Russia's uh, having on Ukraine at this point in time. Obviously, uh, Russia is banned, I think, from all European competitions going forward next season, and there's probably a lot of complications to that um, for Russian clubs at this moment in time. So that's why, and he's been back in Sweden for a long time, so he's obviously not keen and returning to, to Russia under those circumstances. But just to tell you what we're talking about in terms of the, the hurdle of the signing, Natasha, um, Paul behind the scenes is asking, if we sign Jota and Bernabe, it'll take a net spend to circa 18.35 million. Um, how much more will the, the board be prepared to spend? Do, do you think something like this would suit us and that the fact is a free transfer? Yeah, I think, you know, we need to take that into consideration. Obviously, we're sitting here considering it from a fan's perspective. You know, I'm not too worried about balancing the books. There's other people who get paid money to do that. That's on them. I'm looking at it from a fan's perspective and and do I want them in and do I not? But we've got to be realistic as well. You know, the, the model is what it is. The pockets are not unlimited. You know, we do have to consider how much we're spending. Um and I think we have to probably look at it as an overall expenditure against what we're bringing in. And I think when we're looking at what we're bringing in, we can include the Champions League money in that. Um, and we can look at what's already, you know, been accumulated over the last couple of seasons that's perhaps not been spent yet. So, yeah, well, I don't think the board are going to make too many, you know, bigger transfers. When we've already looked at, you know, Carter Vickers. We've looked at hopefully Jota, Burnaby, you know, that that's big expense. I can't see many more players of that value coming in. I, you know, I wouldn't bet against us maybe bringing in a couple of players on loan, maybe some at the sort of lower budget end of the market and a free transfer would obviously suit us absolutely perfectly. You know, Larson's not going to have been on small wages um, over, in, over in Russia. But, you know, if he wants to make the move happen, I don't think that that would be a big obstacle to a move to Celtic. So, yeah, the free transfer market, the loan market is definitely one I see us exploring more, particularly given the three sort of bigger expenditures that I've mentioned. Whether Jordan Larson's going to be one of them, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, Lanky's came in in the comments here to say, a good few years ago with the Swedish centre-half for a striker, uh, Johan and Henry, it could be Starfelt and uh, Jordan, yeah, if the, the Larson name's not enough to see them. I'm sure Big Carroll could have a lot of them and try and um, And get he's been playing with uh, Michael, or training at least with Michael Listig as well, hasn't he? I'm mm-hmm. sure he's been yep. over there and joined the same club that um, Michael's at. So I'm sure, as we all know, Michael has plenty of nice things to say about Celtic and Jordan won't be a stranger to, to those. So I'm sure they've been having some nice conversations about Celtic over there. Yep, just as long as he doesn't phone up big mate Barkey um, over in Holland. <laughs> he'll definitely not be coming to Celtic. Um, Patrick Barkas not feeling the love at all from the hoops. Um, will you be feeling the love towards Celtic if we do sell one of our key assets this uh, summer? Or do you think that might possibly need to happen to fund this uh, transfer window? Well, I, I doubt it needs to happen with the £35 million we're going to get from the Champions League. Um, you know, Normally, with you know, I don't know how much we get from the Europa League exactly. I think it's just over ten million. But then, even then, our net spend is always about zero. We always try and balance it. 
So with an extra 20 million, we could probably afford to, to have an spend of 20 million, although I don't think that's going to happen. Um, as long as it's not one of the really key players like Jovanovic or Kyogo, and you're not going to sell Carter because you've just signed them. But if we can shift some dead wood, we'd make a bit of money from that. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm not too keen on selling anyone uh, too major just now because, you know, we're only one year into this. We're definitely trying to become a better team this summer. You can see that. Ange wants to make his mark in Europe as well as domestically. Um, I, th- I, I, I really, really don't want us to sell anyone, but obviously, you know, uh, I have full confidence in the club to replace him at this point. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I actually don't think we're going to sell one of our key players in this season. I don't think this is the point to sell anybody. We're going into the Champions League. All players should want to play in that. I'm fairly confident about this deal with Jota. I'm confident about Alexandro coming in too. And that we probably will sign a kind of number six central defensive midfielder type player. Um, Natasha, what's your take on this one? Do you see Celtic possibly cashing in on somebody just now? But surely it just makes more sense to wait and you'll probably increase their market value. Yeah, I can't see it to be honest. Like we've talked about before, and like Han just mentioned, we're still trying to build the house. The house isn't finished. When you're still trying to build something beautiful for the neighbourhood, you, you don't start ripping up parts of it while you're still building it. Um, yeah, you maybe get rid of some of the parts that you, you don't need, the, the sort of fringe players, if you like, and you know, selling a few of them can, can add to the funds. But we're certainly not giving any substantial pieces of this house away at this stage. Um, Juranovic is probably the key concern for me at the moment um we know that he's been linked Fabrizio said last week that there was a number of clubs in for him and for me you know when it was just you know that sort of oh there's a number of clubs looking that sort of thing you know I was a little bit calmer but it, it begins to gather a bit more substance um when it's you know a named club so now we've got Atletico Madrid um apparently and for them those rumors then start to have a bit more foundation you know that the club themselves are being asked about them this isn't just you know some agent trying to push his player out via someone's account like Fabrizio Romano to try and get a bit of interest in them you know there is a club named now and it starts to have a bit more substance but you know Atletico need a new right back you know their current right back is a Croatian teammate of Juranovic um, and he's leaving on a free transfer to Olympiakos so the, you know they're in the market for a right back and Juranovic is going to be someone they know all about because suddenly he sort of took the place of the, their own right back. So you can see why they'd be looking at him. You can see why someone looks at all these pieces of a jigsaw and puts them together that Atletico will be in for Josip. But uh, it would need to be a big offer to get Celtic to the table for someone like Juranovic, wouldn't it? He's got, you know, he's 11 months into a five year deal. You know, he's an international level player. He's the perfect fit for Angie's system. The fans like him. He's playing well. You know, we're not in a position that we need to sell them. You know, so for all those reasons, it would really need to be a big number for me before Celtic would even entertain an offer like that. Um, yeah. and for, for Juranovic as well, you know, why does it make sense for him to to move right now? Like you touched on, Declan, the Champions League football's coming up, a chance to play in the group stages. And for him as well, he's got a World Cup coming up in four and a half months. The last thing, you know, he wants to risk, and we've seen it before, is a player can move to a new club, feel unsettled, it doesn't quite work out. He doesn't want to, you know, uproot his career at this stage with that World Cup looming. So for him, I think the best move is to stay put. You know, if he does fancy a move somewhere else playing a different league, then January might be a better option for him. Um, who knows? But right now, I don't see Celtic entertaining an offer for Juranovic. But if it comes in big, like we've touched on, you add those funds to the, you know, transfer kitty. You know, if someone comes in, you know, I'm just pulling a number out of the sky. If someone comes in with something upwards of 15, maybe 20 million for Juranovic, at Celtic, you're, you're going to have to consider that. You know, you just are. Because, you know, we paid two and a half million for him last year. If you can, you know, make that sort of increase in profit on your purchase in the space of 11 months, then it's got to be something they're going to consider. You just have to trust them to take it and reinvest it. In the squad, you know, because one sale like that covers that, you know, 18 and a half million expenditure we just talked about. So, you know, that's a very easy book balance. But I don't think we're in a position that we need to do that. And I hope that we don't. <laughs> that a bad feedback here. I don't know if you're tweaking you that. Um, it looks as if, though, he's, he's saying that he is going to be. I don't know what that is. 
That should be it fixed. I don't know what that was at all. Sorry, folks, for that. Um, it could be, I don't know, somebody in the Celtic board, are they moving about switch wires or something? I don't know. But sorry about that. I don't know what that was, so apologies. Um, Juranovic has said on Instagram, Natasha, he's had a wee dig at Joe Hartson. We'll see, he should make keep everything safe. So hopefully he hasn't got any bad, but I think what you say there is absolutely correct. You know, if there's a big, um, a big money offer coming in from him, it does need to be considered. But as well as that, Patrick, I think what you say there is that if the manager's quite happy to sell for that, I think he can replace it. It's possibly a no-brainer on that one. But we'll see how that um, that goes. Um, again, we don't want to lose it at this point in time. Still don't know what, why we're getting that. Um, yeah, players returned to Linux team yesterday, Patrick. Julian was spotted. I know you were the, the eagle eyed man that spotted him in it. Is he the type of player that, that needs to go to try and free up wages just now? Or do you give him another chance for that? He's only got a year left in the deal. Um, to me, if you're not going to plan on extending it next year, surely you need to cash in just now and try and get some money back in and free up some wages. Yeah, I think you either need to sell him or start playing him. And I can't see his playing him. Um, you know, I think that chance came and went in February. Um, you know, I think with the, uh, gosh, I'm getting, getting my timeline mixed up here, but I think it was either just before or just after Bodo Glimt we played in the cup. He came on for about 13 minutes. And, Against Rafe Rovers. Aye, and we all thought you might get some game time. I don't think any of us thought he would break into the team, but he'd get some game time leading up to the end of the season and never seen him again until uh, Trophy Day, where he sort of gave up a half-hearted wave to the Green Brigade to say goodbye. Um, well, we assume anyway. But, yeah, I can see him going. Um, I know we bought him for £7 million, but I doubt we'll get much back from him. You know, he's, as I say, he's got 13 minutes under his belt in the last 18 months. So it, it's debatable what teams would actually pay for a player like that. But I, I think he's one that I can definitely see leaving. And freeing up wages, it's not insignificant because when you've got guys like beat on Rogic and Julian leaving, you know, you get Barkas as well. I'm sure we're still paying some of his wage, but you're probably not far off a hundred grand a week there, but just with those four players. Yeah, it's a massive chunk of money. I know yesterday Paul and maybe we're talking about Albin Agate, the Tasha. I again is are these players that you even if you can't, you know, if you're not gonna get a fee from just getting out the door on loan and try and recoup some of the money that you're paying out in the wages, then you can look towards the loan market to even bring in people that will add a bit to our, our squad just now. Yeah, I think it's about sort of, you know, damage limitation on some of them at the moment. Um, we need to try and recoup something. You know, we're not going to recoup the full amount that we paid for them. We're not going to recoup their full amount of wages if we put them out on loan. But at this stage, something is better than nothing because they're not going to make an impact on the first team um, and they're not going to, you know, benefit the squads as a whole. So I think the best option is to find some sort of move Um and try and recoup something. If we could do it with Barkas, then I think there's, you know, hope for a lot of, you know, the other French players, you know, the Igetis, the Soros, pl players like that, who the concern was that, you know, who is going to come in for these guys? Because they've not been playing, they've not been seen a lot of, you know, they're not exactly in the shop window. So I can't imagine there's, you know, a host of clubs clambering to, to sign them on the basis of, you know, very little football over the last year. But, you know, we've seen Utrecht taking a gamble on Barkas, so it gives me hope that we can do something similar with some of these other fringe players that we've mentioned. Um, I think we will probably be still contributing something to Barkas's wage. And similarly, we might have to do the same to get some of these other players off the books and elsewhere. But if we're able to recoup something, that's money we can take and reallocate to a player who can benefit the first team squad. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get deals for them somewhere and if we've done it with Barkas um, then I'm sure we can do it with these ones as well yeah, Just to kind of move away from, from football um, on the part just now Patrick yesterday you know fixtures were, were announced that had been changed two away games Kilmarnock and the United both now 12 o'clock and the, the first Glasgow Derby game of the season is going to be half past 12 on a Saturday um, the, the, the thing that stood out in that was Ross County it's so far as we know it's staying as a Saturday and it's staying at three o'clock, which is great for the home fans. Um, it's probably good for some of those travelling up from Glasgow because they wouldn't need to leave at seven in the morning, um, like we usually have to, mm -hmm. to get up to Dingwall. But in terms of how other folk are going to be able to watch this, we know that in April, uh, the chief executive of the SPFL, Neil Doncaster, said that the pay-per-view was getting 
uh, you know, binned. What's your take on this? Because surely clubs were benefiting from the pay-per-view that they've been able to use, set up and sell on to fans. I'm sure some Celtic fans would have probably purchased the pay-per-view. I know other people have ways of watching games which are being discouraged. We've obviously seen um, in recent weeks somebody get a very low, lengthy jail sentence for streaming um, football games. But what's your take on this and how do we get around it? Because if we're not going to let clubs stream the games professionally and officially, then people can only turn to that if they want to watch their football team. If they can't yeah, get to the game, obviously. I mean, you're undermining the authorities who, who have given that lengthy... Was it a, a prison sentence? Uh, that, yeah. That, well, yeah. Two years you're, to, you're totally undermining that because you have literally no other way to watch the game. I mean, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know where streaming services would get the stream from. Maybe some foreign uh, TV channel or Ross County TV or something. But you know, I, I think we all seen in Twitter a couple of weeks ago that the past to paradise has been shut down because I think it was Sky's doing. I don't think it was the SPFL. I think it was very much Sky wanting to have a total monopoly on broadcasting rights, but they want to have a, a monopoly and then they're not showing the first away game of the season for the champions. Um, not only the champions, but the biggest team in the country. It, it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, as someone who's definitely not going to Ross County next season, um, it's it's proven a bit of a problem to, you know, how am I going to watch the team? How am I going to watch the game? Um, it's disappointing, and you know I'm not sure how you how you fix it without Sky broadcasting every single game. Yeah, Natasha, what's your take this? Because as well as that, allocations are continuing to get cut. I just read there that I think Kilmarnock at Rugby Park is going to return to one stand. So again, that's going to be another big cut in allocation. We know that Hearts have sold the season tickets, sold out of season tickets, and that Roseburn stand. So it's only going to be that wee tiny section there. Aberdeen just seems to get pushed back and pushed back. I'm actually surprised we're not in the beach up there at Pitodre. We know about the allocation we get at Ibrooks. We have smaller allocations than that. I saw yesterday it was becoming a Celtic Rangers debate on Twitter with people jumping in from other clubs in the SPFL saying, look at you whinging again because you're not getting your team on telly. Now, we know ourselves that it's unfair the way that it's disproportionately... Um, laid out that Celtic Rangers get more games, you know, it's unfair for Aberdeen, Hearts, Hibs, you know, among others, fans. But, you know, there needs to be a way that football fans of any club in the league can watch their team, whether it's in Sky or whether it's through the clubs. And this just seems absolutely mental. It does. And for me, it comes down to as well, it's failure to properly market our game. We are not capitalising on everything that Scottish football has to offer if no one can see it. And the deals that we're signing up to with, you know, Sky and whoever else, aren't properly reflecting the game that we have here because they're just not valuing it enough. And we've complained about this so many times. We only have to look at the coverage that they do provide. Um, you know, look at last season. They didn't actually show as many games as they bought. So, you know, that's, you know, they're not even taking advantage of the deal that they have managed to secure. And now not showing the, you know, first away game of the season for the champions. It's just frustrating and it's a real failure to, to market and, you know, put out there what Scottish football has to offer and we're never going to be able to develop you know football in Scotland and get better deals and things like that if the people who are organizing them arranging them and negotiating them are allowing for things like this to happen um it's frustrating and like you've said on top of that we've got the ticket allocation issue and we saw last season Declan it got tougher and tougher for away tickets and I think this season's going to be even worse as far as I'm aware um the club are trying. They've tried to have meetings with the other clubs in the league and fix the issues of last season, you know, the away ticket allocations, because it's frustrating for everyone in the circumstances where, you know, Celtic haven't been given this full allocation and half the stands are sitting empty. That's frustrating. I think the club were trying to address that. Now, from what I believe in these meetings where they were trying to increase their allocation again, we were in fact told that our allocation would be cut further in almost every ground that they've went to um and that's frustrating now listen if the if the host club can sell out their whole stadium to their own fans then i absolutely understand that why give the away team an advantage get as many of your home fans in there as possible to cheer on your team i have absolutely no issues with that kind of like you know what hearts have done if they can sell out their season tickets if they can get the whole of time castle full of Hearts supporters then you can't argue with that you know that's but it does become more frustrating where the stadiums are sitting emptier. And, you know, we've got thousands of fans who would want to be in there. 
you know, it must be the only business model in the in the world where you're turning away paying customers. But I've talked to you know fans of other clubs about this, and there is a sort of perception that they would rather the the stands sit empty, the seats are empty, than give more tickets to away fans because you know it's putting them at a detriment. They'd rather have the empty seats than someone cheering on the opposition team. So I get that business wise from the clubs. I'm not sure it makes so much sense, but they are appeasing their own fans, and it just looks like it's going to be difficult next year for away tickets and. We go again in the scrambles before the games. Yeah, it will be a scramble again, which is, you know, it's, it's a real shame because Celtic fans want to go and support their team and they just can't because of these these allocation cuts. Another one I forgot to mention was St Mumble, they're getting one stand through in Paisley. Um, and again, you know, one of the games I fight back to, the, the 3-2 game I put with Audrey, I remember looking over to my right at the, the Richard Donald stand up the top and it was absolutely empty. Mm-hmm. You could count the people that were sitting up there. And it's a real, real frustration. But as you say, Natasha, I think Angela Forbes and people at Celtic have tried to engage with clubs um, across the country and they're just not interested. And I, I think it's it's quite uh, ironic that the team that was given us the biggest allocation, Livingston, um, we struggled to beat up until just there, you know, nearly a four-year run. Mm-hmm. So all this stuff about home advantage, you know, and having a big crowd, it didn't do Livingston any harm. You know, why couldn't it be the same for some of the other clubs? I know St Johnson tried it. Yeah. I don't know if they'll go back to the, the two stands behind the goal next season and about the main stand, obviously. Um, like, not the COVID season. Yeah, the COVID season. Just before the COVID season, sorry. I'm getting mixed up here. Just before the COVID season, because we didn't get obviously St Johnson last season as that game was behind closed doors. The, the season 2018 19 with three stands up there, and it was great, you know, great atmosphere, and it brought in great revenue at the club. Patrick, are you. An agreement that it's about how you communicate this with your fans. I know Alan Burrows came out on Twitter from Motherwell to say, um, was he explaining it to JP Mason, our very own JP, that you know it was about trying to create something at the club. But I think if you communicate something to fans that this might pay for the next player this season and it might give us that wee bit extra to grow and try and challenge whether that be for a European spot, that communication is key in all of this. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I think Aberdeen and Motherwell are are the frustrating ones, uh, mainly, you know, Aberdeen in particular, which is quite funny because, you know, I think the the last time Aberdeen beat us was February 2016, and they've been reducing their allocation, I think it's year on year, to the point where, I mean, you two will know better than me, I think it's something like 800 tickets we get or something like that. Um, I don't know, but the banner that's beside the fence just seems to keep moving and moving (laughs) forward. So there's there's Uh, a fence there that splits you between yourself and Aberdeen fans. Empty right. seats and a large banner. Right. Um, and yet we, we still turn up and beat them. I know we do twice uh, under Lennon Kennedy, but you know, apart from that, I think we've won just about every single game since February 2016. Um, that is frustrating because, you know, there's an opportunity there for clubs to make more money. I know that, you know, there was a, there was a 20s plenty campaign just before COVID hit and charging 30 quid for a football game you know, it's a bit, it's a bit much in times like these. But again, it is an opportunity for clubs to make money. It is an opportunity for Scottish football to try and better itself. You know, we're just talking about these TV deals. You need to try and take every opportunity you can get. And as Natasha says, they're turning away paying customers every single weekend. It's it's really really unbelievable. And then another great point, Livingston. You know, they were the ones that gave us three stands out of four, and we couldn't buy a one. I mean. I think it was something like seven games we played there, and we couldn't even win a game. Uh, it's, you know, I, I can understand, you know, or Celtic and Rangers. Why do you, why do you ha- why do you have the God given right to have every single away game broadcast when the ten other clubs don't? But the reality is, the ten other clubs can probably there's probably away tickets going spare. You know, when Hearts go to Livingston, they don't sell out the away end, or when St Mern go to Aberdeen, they're not selling out the away end. They could follow their team to Aberdeen. I know it's a financial burden, but there are away tickets available, unlike when Celtic or Rangers turn up to a ground. You know, the, mm. the, the allocation's always sold out. So it's quite frustrating. There's a lot to it. And, you know, I think for the sake of the league, I think you should always try and sell as many tickets as possible. Yeah, I totally agree. And again, even today, it was made a kind of... Uh, I saw it in the SPFL Facebook page where they announced that the Premier sports cup is to get record funding for this season 
with a grand total of £350,000 to the winners, <laughs> which is absolute, it's little money compared to what you can make, you know, I think that, you know, a Premier League club would laugh if they were offered that for winning a cup down there, so it just shows the, the gap, and even English football in England, thankfully, is starting to take that step forward, it's becoming far more professional, there's more money going into it, I think for winning one of the cups down there, Natasha, you'd probably know a lot better than this than me, I know you follow women's football very closely, and I think if you win one of the cups down in England, the prize money is a lot more than it is for winning the league in Scotland. Yeah, that's right. I don't remember what it is exactly, but it's definitely higher than the, the Scottish League. There's been great funding going into that league from Barclays. Um, they really are trying to push it and promote the game down there. And it's working. You know, you do just need the right investment, the right sponsors, the right supporters. The more money that goes into it, the better the quality is. And you could probably make the same argument for Scottish football. The quality will be better, the better deals we get, the better sponsorship we get, the more money we get going into it. And Instead, we're talking about not all our games even being visible to the fans and three hundred and fifty grand for winning a cup. I mean, it's just yeah, it's just frustrating. You know, I think I read somewhere somewhere along the lines that um, you get roughly two hundred and fifty thousand pounds for one of your players going to the World Cup because you know Hearts now have three players apparently heading off with Australia and they're seeing this as a bit of a a windfall. You know, so when you have just about as much money for that than you do for winning a cup in Scotland. I mean, it really just shows you the level that this league is operating at, and it's just not anywhere near enough if we want to grow the game and improve the game over here. Yeah, that is something um, I was actually going to touch on. Celtic will probably benefit from Tom Roddy if he does get selected for a silver because the rules are that it's the player, let me get this right, yeah, it's the player must have been registered in a club's books for two years for you to get the money, and if it's not, it's split. So guys like Kyogo, guys in Maeda, um, who are the stick-ons to go to the World Cup, obviously Josip Juranovic too, um, we won't get the full financial amount, but we'll get something probably in the region of about you know, 300000 I think it is. It's based on per day, how much the players there. It starts two weeks before the World Cup kicks off and ends the day after the, the team is eliminated. So we're actually hoping that Japan maybe go a wee bit further in as well. It will increase the finances um, that we would get. I think it's something like $8,000 a day you get for a player, um, probably could be connected on that, but that was something that I read, um, so quite interesting, but it's a good point Natasha, that players just nip their way to a tournament mm -hmm. um, in mid-November, there's going to be probably more financially benefiting to, to Celtic than it is to, to go on and win a, a bit of silverware this season, which is quite a, a sad state of affairs and basically sums up the, the way our league's marketed in, in Scotland. Um, to move on to to more probably cheerier things because we'll end up putting ourselves down with us. Um, Bailey Rice's name appeared this morning, Patrick. Um, 15 year old Motherwell super kid is dubbed as. Um, now, if Motherwell went to cash in the player just now, they would receive more money in add ons before he signs that pro contract because then it's just the, the compensation fee. If you take anything without this, because you probably didn't know what I did. Lee. Scott about him before today like myself. Um, it maybe says a wee bit more about this B team system and a bit of restructure, and that Celtic's actually really gone out and looking for potential. And um, what, what, what's your take on this? Celtic Rangers are meant to be the two teams you opened bids with Premier League clubs also interested in the player. Yeah, it was something we were probably um, you know looking upon negatively about five or six years ago when you know Chelsea signed Billy Gilmore from Rangers and. Bayern Munich were taking some of our 16 and 17 year olds from the academy. We were saying to ourselves, well, what chance do we stand mm -hmm. if these sort of super clubs are signing players at 16 and 17? But the fact that we are doing it as well, you know, it's the way the game's going. I think, you know, paying hundreds of thousands of pounds for guys who have never uh, kicked a ball professionally. Um, I, I, I mean, you've got it spot on. I hadn't heard of the guy before his name came out of your mouth. Uh, I won't claim to know anything about him. But, you know, it can't do any harm if, if all the big clubs are interested in them in England and, you know, Rangers as well. Aye, it's it's the way football's going and hopefully Celtic can get them. Yeah, Natasha, what's your take on this? Do you think there has been that change in structure? And that B team, obviously, Stephen McManus has dropped in there um, during the days around there. I'm not too sure what the where, where Tommy McIntyre is and all of this, but it looks as if there is a, a change in approach for next season because... Again, this could possibly be Celtic's B team's last uh, season in the Lowland League. 
Yeah, like you guys, obviously we don't know too much about the player, but what we do know is about what it represents that our B team system is looking like. Um, if we are able to attract the top talent at that age in the country, then that's exactly what the system is there for. If these young guys at that age who do have big potential and have a lot of interest start to see Celtic as a really good option for their career development, then great, because that's exactly what we're trying to achieve with the B team structure and the links to the first team. So if they're looking at that and saying, you know, they've got that B team, they're playing in the Lowland League, there's a clear link between where that is and my career trajectory up to the first team at Celtic, that's what we want to show them. If we can show them that, then it does make Celtic a great option. And that's what we've been trying to say for, for ages. We need Celtic to be a really good option for young players to develop their careers. And we've lost too many young players because for some reason they're not seeing that or they're seeing something better overseas. Like, you know, look at Hjelde or or other players that like Doke, you know, that sort of ilk. They're seeing better options down south or in Europe. We want players like that, of that ability, to start seeing Celtic as the best option for their career and their development. And if this young player has looked at what we've got our set up now and saying, that's the right place for me to be, then then that's great. And hopefully more players of his kind will follow suit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, but it's, it's about exploiting the market and trying to get people in. I think that's important. The path is really, really important. And again, we've benefited um, from Motherwell's Youth Academy before. We are very on David Turnbull now. Um, so, you know, well done to Motherwell for producing players. It's obviously Campbell who made his Scotland debut a, a few weeks back too. Um, so, but well done to them for this. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to look at how this develops a wee bit more with, with the B team uh, next season. Just quickly, Patrick, what's your take on the uh, open goal, Broomhill? Because they're obviously going to be... In there, they were, I think they were called BSC or they were called Broomhill last year. Now we've got this big marketing campaign. We've got Paul Slane back you know, to play football and Cy Ferry as a gaffer. What, what was your take on all of this? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I'm not opposed to you know a company buying a club, but installing Cy Ferry as a manager, now you've got Paul Slane playing. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's... I'm not sure about it, to be honest. You know, I don't know how many uh, lifelong Broomhill fans there are out there, but I'm sure they're probably not best pleased. Then again, they could make their way up the leagues, although I highly doubt it. Um, it just seems like a bit of a laugh just now. I'm not sure how seriously everyone's taking it. I'm not really sure what to make of it, to be honest. I'm not really sure. Um, Natasha, what's your take on it? I know Cy yeah. quite well, so I'm hoping it does well. Yeah, I know, I know, I think... But... I think Sai will be taking this very seriously. You know, I don't think he's in it for a gimmick or I think he's very serious about his coaching career and I think that he really is taking this seriously. On the other hand, you know, the whole production round about him are perhaps the ones that aren't taking it as seriously. You know, I'm sure, you know, Simon is working very hard behind the scenes, but mm -hmm. the whole promo of it and the way it's been pitched, they just need to be careful not to make it seem too much like a gimmick. Um, you know, the announcement of Paul Slane, I think, is perhaps up there with what's making it seem a little bit gimmicky. I think if there's anyone on the fence about whether it's a good thing or bad thing, I think that's probably tipped them in the wrong direction, the way that that announcement was handled and things like that. And you just have to think, you know, there's a lot of football fans in that Lowland League who are very passionate about their clubs. You know, you think about, you know, the people you know and you think about, you know, you your own team. If that happened to your team, how would you perceive it? And I don't think that, a lot of them would take it very well. Um, yeah, it's got potential. I'm sure Sai's got great contacts. I'm sure he's, the players he's bringing in are really going to improve the club. Um, I think what they need now, I think the best thing for them would be just to get the season started so that they can prove that it isn't just you know a social media gimmick or anything like that and that they have put a good team together that are going to get good performances, good results, good players and you know, establish it as a football team rather than just a sort of social media phenomenon at the moment, which is sort of what it's looking like. So yeah, get the season started, let them prove themselves um, and we'll see. Yeah, I've been interested to see they've signed a lot of players from League One and League Two and again, you know, everything around uh, Slaney's career uh, is quite sad and, you know, retiring mm -hmm. so young and now coming back and hopefully, you know, he, he kicks on and they can do well for, for his sake and obviously, as I say, I'd quite like to see Cy Ferry do well and he was working with Celtic when he was doing under 10s and 11s coaching so yeah. hope he does well and he will be taking this uh, extremely seriously. Um, another name from the past, Patrick, you actually mentioned him last week. Emilio Ruiz Aguirre it looks set to retire at the grand old age of 36. 12 major honours with Celtic. He was a bit of a hero, I think, for me. I don't know about you growing up. 
Um, Bubba's him all the best. I think whenever you mention as his name to anybody, you get a, a smile on their face, don't you? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Fan favourite, you know. Uh, by the time I'd uh, started going to games, it was like the sort of last two or three years of his career um, at Celtic, and then he came back uh, for one season, one bit of a disaster that season. But you know, we still love him and great character. Um, I I don't know what else to say really. Um, he, he definitely had his best years at Celtic. I think that's fair to say. He stuck around when he probably could have left. You know, I think there was a few English clubs in from it a certain point and obviously had a nasty injury as well, but a fantastic player in his day and, you know, I think it's like what Samurai says, he can leave for money, but then you sort of want to look back at these happy memories, connections with clubs and supporters and trophy cabinets as well and, you know, that's that stuff's sort of irreplaceable and I'm sure as a give, he's got plenty of money anyway, so, aye, brilliant servant for Celtic and, you know, loved by many. Yeah, he was loved by many. Um, we're getting a wee bit of feedback sounder. Should be all right. The cast is the culprit. I know I was getting the blame in the comments, but I'm going to need to point the finger here. Um, but we'll do our wee European uh, slant again. It's another tip doing maybe right away with this one. Uh, Spartak Moscow, we're doing 2007-2008. It's actually, obviously, we're going to go over to Legia to play in Arthur Boric's testimonial. Um, we'll think URI is going to be making that tip over the space. And we've got Champions League games to look forward to. But it was uh, heart your mouth stuff, like that game at Celtic Park. A big offer came up with the goods to send us right into the Champions League again. Yeah, I think um, if you talk about some really memorable nights at Celtic Park, I think that's one that a lot of people mention, and it's definitely one I mention. Um, it was just one of those nights, wasn't it? Um, it was electric, the atmosphere was incredible, um, and probably always remembered as one of Arthur Boric's finest moments. You could, It was the sort of night that you could feel the stand shaking. The place was literally rocking. Um, yeah. Incredible, um, and everything that came with it as well. But getting into that group stage, the value of those penalty saves was just incredible. And what scenes at Celtic Park, those are the nights that we're looking forward to. Um, and I'm sure there'll, there'll be a couple of good ones like that coming up with the with the group stages this season. Yeah, hopefully, there will be a good couple of nights. Hopefully, we don't kick off the campaign, Patrick, um, a 2 0 defeat. <laughs> um, away from home but certainly if we can beat the champions of Europe if we have them in our group um, that would be nice obviously Celtic in the second game of, of that group stage went on to beat AC Milan with that really late goal from uh, Scott McDonald um, big McManus with the goal before that how how do we get back to these nights Patrick you know but we look back on these with the old fondness if you watch the clips back you know that late goal obviously we've experienced that in recent times with the Lazio game for instance with Julian's late goal how do we get back to, to those special nights? Or do you think the gap um, is just, you know, what's that, 15 years ago now? Do you think that's gone? Or do you think we can still do it? Um, no, I think we can still do it. You know, the gap at that point was pretty big. Um, you know, as much as Strachan was a great Celtic manager by a great Celtic team, it was definitely a, a downgrade on the O'Neill years. But yet, there are so many nights from Strachan's uh, three, four years where they seem to just stand out. And, you know, that season's probably better remembered for the, the way we won the league so late on uh, up at Tannadice on a Thursday night. But we did have great nights that season. And I think we can have great nights again, especially on, on the range. Um, you know, to, to beat the champions of Europe, we, you know, no offence to them, Scott McDonald and Stephen McManus scoring the two goals. You, you probably wouldn't have bet on that at the time. But we, we managed it. We managed it. And, you know, I think I'm right in saying that's the one with the goalie after conceding the late goal feigned injury, um, which is which is pretty funny to look back on, um, because it just sort of falls to the ground. But no, I think we can, I think we can do it again. I don't know if we'll be able to beat Real Madrid this season. Uh, I hope we don't get them in the group. I'll be honest, but I think we can have special nights again. Yeah, Real Madrid's a, a bring it on for me because I've had a trip to the, the Bernabeu <laughs> and I've never been to Madrid. I feel it's quite a nice city. So yeah, fire Madrid, stay in our group, do the business at Celtic Park, and hopefully get a throw over there. Um, and yes, I've had my breakfast this morning. Don't worry, I'm not going <laughs> cuckoo. Um, back to back with Benfica, Natasha. Defeat over there. They won a game at Celtic Park. Um, Eddie McGeady got the goal. Obviously, he's now away to Hibs. There's a wee link into there. What, what, what do you make of that sign? I think Eden's 36. Um, I'd heard of this, got wind of it a good few weeks ago. Um, I think it's a good move for Hibs, you know, bringing him in. He will no doubt, you know, be a player that other 
you know, the younger players certainly within that dressing room at Easter Road will look towards. He's been there and done it, and uh, he's back in the league that he knows very, very well. Yeah, a good move for everyone. I think a good move for Aidan, you know, coming back up to Scotland, playing for a club like Hibs, um, at this sort of late stage in his career, you know, that's that's a good club for him to play at. And for Hibs, I think they've got a player there who's still, you know, got a bit left in them. You know, they've almost signed him on a one-year deal, I think. You know, they're not being unrealistic about this. But I don't think he's finished yet. Um, that is my line playoff, so... Look at this. By the way... <laughs> Patrick, I'll come to you in this one. Um, yeah, oh. what, what do you think of that move? As I say, I had told you this weeks ago, didn't I? And I called it that that's what it was going to add to. Um, I think it's a good move for Braden to go to Hibs. Uh, he said to me about a week before it happened, I, and I'd said it was, I, you to, can totally see it, but uh, obviously you knew what was happening. Uh, no, I think it's a good move for both parties. Um, obviously, you know, Aiden might not be happy, but he's probably got to be realistic at his age. You know, a one-year deal might not be ideal. He might want a bit more security than that. But, you know, I think, did you say he's 36 or 37? You know, he seems older because of the time. He's been around for so long. Aye. But, aye, I think it's a good move. Uh, it'll be nice to see him back in Scottish football. I'm sure uh, all the away grounds that he goes to, they'll, they'll welcome him back with open arms, I'm sure. Tyne Castle and Ibrox will be a lovely warm reception for him. Um, yeah, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm sure dad, it'll be everything to do with Hibs and nothing to do with his uh, international career. Yeah, I'm sure his dad will be able to pry it on his uh, Celtic scarf as he probably goes into that <laughs> tiny stand that's going to be at Tynecastle. And I'm sorry, at Tynecastle, I think for Edinburgh Derby's Hibs are still going to get the full end, if I'm right in saying that. I think that was the only game that you don't get your, your season ticket. Tasha's returned from her partial deliveries or whatever was getting dropped. Yeah, off. If, if anyone is listening, I was not getting another online shopping delivery. I know that <laughs> my, my dad listens to this, so if he hears that I'm getting another online shopping delivery, I think I'll be in trouble. So if anyone is listening, it definitely was not that. Just it was a window cleaner then coming that's to collect right. the, the money right, from doing the, the, the chores outside the house. Um, yeah, so Benfica spoke about there and it was another late late show Natasha again another really really special night with the Massimo Donati goal in 92 minutes at the very end of that game and another blast from the past Yuri Yarisic was the man that scored the first goal for Celtic that night against Shakhtar mm-hmm. but that one really did contribute to his getting through to the the next stages um, in the, the knockout room Yeah it was important because it meant that we you know we were still faced with you know that trip away to, to AC Milan after that one and we didn't have to you know concern ourselves about trying to get anything there which I think we were aware it wasn't going to be an easy task anyway so you know that win there was massive I think it was always going to come down to that being one of the or the biggest game of the campaign um so to get that last minute goal again was just brilliant and I think it sort of summed up Celtic's group stage that season is that sort of never say die keep fighting till the end um a very Ange Postacoglu we never stop um and I think we'll probably see more of that from the team this season um because you know you look at it there was a few late goals scored in that campaign at home you know there's a McDonald one um against AC Milan that we obviously all remember that came you know in the 91st minute then the Donati one you know coming in the 92nd against Shakhtar Donetsk to win the game and even if you go to the Benfica game. The, the McGeady goal came, you know, into Addy time in the first half. That's so we were leaving it, we were leaving it late in all of these and each of them were, you know, match running goals. So very important to to keep that momentum going right to the end of the first half, right to the end of the game. And I think that's something they've probably got to look forward to this season as well, because it's very much in line with Angie's mentality. And we saw how important it was in that campaign. I think it'll be equally important in this one as well. Yeah, I always talk about that Celtic sucker punch in Europe, which always seems to happen. Um, probably most recently, like the Copenhagen game, Patrick, if you remember, scored the penalty and then bang, you know, you'd know, you much rather they scored the penalty and then they blew the whistle, um, much like the goals in, in those games. But yeah, we went over to Milan, we lost the game 1-0, and um, Zaghi scored the goal. Not a bad performance to go over there and only lose 1-0 in the, the San Siro. Then we get through. Um, my dad made the trip over to the, the new camp. It was his 40th that Christmas, so that was what we got him for his 40th birthday. Went over there, um, and his big mate Brian McCallum managed to take the remote control for the telly, and he's uh, I think it was his jacket pocket by accident. He's, whatever he'd been, I don't know how it managed to get in there. He'd either been sitting in the house or that like hoodie pocket, sorry, and he pulled it in the remote control for the telly and a, a bar in uh, Barcelona. But yeah, 
don't do that if you go away on a holiday. Fad, <laughs> bad idea. I don't think I think he got a really hard time when he got back home uh, from his missus with that one. But yeah, three two at Celtic Park. Disappointing. Probably the game you need to try and get something from if you're going to get past there. Um, but again, you know, really coming up against top top quality sides in the competition. Um, you know, Messi got two goals that night. This was Messi just starting to kind of come come up and everybody start to take notice of the, the wee man. Um, but I think something with that Celtic team that replicates the Celtic team also is I really fancy to score against any team this season just with the, the, the way we play football. You subscribe to that, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, I think it was, uh, was it Barry Robson with a header that night? Mm. Am I right in saying that? Uh, yeah, what there's player? no shame in what I, player? There's, there's, uh, he scored an important penalty that season in April. Uh, I think it was mm. April. Um, no, I, there, there's no shame in losing to, to that Barcelona team. I know it was a different manager. I think it was Rijkaard when we lost to them. But, you know, the following season, they win the European Cup in Rome. They're one of the best teams of all time, and a lot of those players were still there. Um, I think Henri was playing for them as well. I think he scored that night. He scored, yep. Um, but I, 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 I totally agree with you. I fancy to score in most games. Um, you know, Leverkusen this uh, last season was a bit of a fluke. You know, I think we deserve more from that game. And then Bodo as well, I think, was a poor performance. But with this team, you really do fancy to score in every single game because we create so many chances. And if we can sort of shore up the defence, keep it settled, um, hopefully sign Souza at least on loan, uh, get a proper defensive midfielder, and you know, hopefully we can we can keep the goals out at the other end. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, but over to the new camp, three minutes, and that was us for the rest of the game. Try to get the goal, and we went out for two in aggregate. We hope um, our European adventures don't uh, end so suddenly as they did that year. But it'd be very nice if we can have a really good go in the group stages. And get out the group stages. It might not be the last 16 of the Champions League, but if we certainly drop into Europa League, I'd fancy to have a go. Thank you for everybody for joining us in the comments. As always, hopefully this time next week when the, the first team are back all together. Obviously, the international boys are still to come back. We've got some more players in the door and we can have a right old uh, chin wag about that. Um, and I've graduated by then too, so I'll be even in a poorer position than I am today, um, waiting on that tomorrow. So thanks everybody for joining us. If you've watched, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And thanks.